Hello! In this tutorial, I'm going to show how to quickly set up a Raspberry Pi to be a Rune endpoint using Diet Pi and some configuration that I've automated using a little script. So here we go. First, we need to download a Diet Pi image. Go to dietpi.com and we're going to download for the Raspberry Pi. And I'm going to save this on our desktop so that it's a little bit easier to find. Very good. Now to open this file on a Mac, you'll need uh, some software called Kika, K-E-K-A. -E you can Google search for that and find it. It's just a software that will allow you to unpack the .7z file format. And that'll give us the Diet Pi image that we need to flash to a SD card. I'm going to take my micro SD card and connect it to my computer using an SD card reader. And we should see it show up there. This is just an empty uh, SD card. There's nothing inside of here. Completely empty. Um, we're going to now we're going to use a, a program called Etcher. We'll select the image on our desktop and the media you want to make sure that the media is the, is the correct one in this case this is the only uh, flash media that I have attached I know that it's a 64 gig micro SD card so I'm pretty sure that's right you definitely want to be careful here that you don't uh, erase something that you care about um, I like to go into settings here and just kind of make sure that everything's correct it's not always necessary to validate on success, um, but I usually have all the rest of the boxes um, unchecked. So now we'll go and flash. All right, that's done. We look at this file now, we'll notice that the name has changed from none to boot. And there are some files there. We need to download a setup script. I think that's what I call it. We're going to store this on that boot location. I'm going to open up a terminal window. I'm going to use iTerm, but you can use just regular Mac terminal if you want to as well. And we'll go to slash volume slash boot. You can see that we have a Diet Pi setup program here. It's actually a Perl script. I'm just going to run it uh, from the command line like this. And we're going to give the Diet Pi a name. And I'm going to say yes, that I have a Wi Fi network. And then I'll put in you need to put in information that's correct for your Wi-Fi network. And then your Wi-Fi password. And then it's going to show you what settings it changed. So it made some set changes to a file called dietpy.txt and then another file called dietpy-wifi.txt. And it configured all of these settings. If the time zone's not right, you can change it later when you start up. I happen to be in California in the US, so that's correct for me. Um, same thing goes for the country code. You can make some changes there to make it match your locale if you need to. All right, next we want to eject the drive. On the Mac, you just drag it to the wastebasket, which feels kind of wrong, but that's how it works. And the next step we're going to do is insert it into a Raspberry Pi and boot it up. Okay, for the next step, we are going to, I've inserted the, pardon me, stop. For the next step, I have inserted the micro SD card into the Raspberry Pi, and I'm going to switch it on and boot the thing up. So you see the familiar Raspberry Pi uh, icons at the top of the screen. This is the very first boot for this device. 
So what it's going to do is unpack the image that we flashed to the micro SD card so that it uses all of the space available. You'll see it reboot at least one time to do all of that. It's normal for it to kind of sit here for a while at this spot. All right, all of the space on the SD card file is being used, so now it's booting for the second time. At this point, it's going to update any packages that have been updated since the last time this image was made. You'll notice that it's already on our Wi-Fi network. We had as an IP address, that LAN IP up at the top of the screen. So our Wi-Fi configuration worked correctly on the first try. Doing a kernel upgrade. If you're doing this in your Raspberry Pi's headless, all this stuff will be happening, but you won't see it. You'll just be waiting for it to show up on the network. If you try to log in over, for example, an SSH connection early, we'll just get a message on the terminal telling you that the system's not quite ready yet for you to log in. So it takes about this amount of time to get set up after a first boot. At this point, we're going to be installing the Rune Bridge software along with any prerequisites, including the ALSA The ALSA package includes some command line tools like Aplay, which we can use to diagnose sound card problems, make sure that the endpoint can actually see whatever output device or sound card we have attached to it. All right, installed Rune Bridge. Now the system's going to reboot again. All right, great. Now we should be able to log in over a terminal. We've got the IP address here. It'll be different on your screen, but this is the one that I see. So I'm going to open up a terminal window and log in to do any final configuration. Okay, now I'm going to log in to the freshly booted Raspberry Pi. The username we're gonna use is root, and the IP address was what I saw on the screen. You can use a program called Fing, F-I-N-G, on your phone or tablet. It's a free program, somewhat ad-supported, to try to find the IP address if you don't have any ways, easy way to do it um, by looking at the console of the device over an HDMI connection. You can also possibly use your router's interface to find the IP address, but we saw this here, so this should work. This is the first time that I'm connecting to this device, so I have to accept its key fingerprint. The password is the default, which is dietpi, in lowercase d-i-e-t-p-i. And uh, as is the case with most software, we have to accept the license agreement. And we're logged in. Um, we can run, there's some commands here that we can run to kind of make some fine-tuning configuration, but the first thing I'm going to do is run play dash L so that I can see if my sound card is, is visible. In this case, I'm using a Hi-Fi Berry DAC Plus Pro. It's a audio interface that connects directly to the GPIO headers on the Raspberry Pi itself. And I can see that the software has already detected it. I'll just go through Diet Pi config and double check the sound options. Right now you can see under sound options that this is the default that's showing up but we'd like to use the correct setting for this. So, pro, there we go, Hi-Fi Berry DAC Plus Pro. So this one right here is the option we're looking for. Tap down and say okay to that. The other thing that I like to do, now that we've gotten things working, we don't need the HDMI connection anymore, is turn this power supply noise reduction on. This is going to disable HDMI output. It's gonna reduce CPU usage and generally Put the device in a lower CPU usage mode, but it'll be quieter and a little bit nicer to use for audio. 
So I like to say yes to that. And we'll exit. It's going to want to reboot one more time. So we're going to let it do that. We can use this ping command to watch to see when it comes back online, or I could go back and watch what's happening on the HDMI output, but this is a little bit easier. All right, we can see that it's back online. In the next step, I'm going to show you how to configure the device in Rune so that we can see it as an output and play music to it. Okay, for the final step, we're going to configure the device in Rune. So we'll launch the Rune application. And you can see I already had it open in the settings section. Uh, we're going to go to the audio section under settings and scroll down and see if we can find our new Raspberry Pi. The IP address in my case, remember, was .8.76. And this is the DAC Plus or DAC Plus Pro uh, interface that we found on it. I'm going to click Enable. Often I'll do it just based on the room that the device is in. Uh, we're going to go to device setup. And in this case, I know that this is a Hi-Fi Berry interface, and that's something that's been rune tested. So I'm going to go and pick it. And it's a Hi-Fi Berry DAC Plus. It's actually very close to what my physical device looks like. I don't want it to be a private zone. I want to be able to control this from any remote in the house. Uh, DSD is not supported, so we're going to convert any DSD files to PCM. It also has no MQA support. Um, I'm going to use the internal volume on this device since I'm going to connect some powered speakers directly to it. But if I was going to connect it to a preamplifier, I would want to use fixed volume instead. Um, and let's go down to show advanced. Um, I found that this device works better uh, when limited to 192 kilohertz. I think it supports 384, but it doesn't support 352.8 or maybe the other one. So I'm going to adjust that a little bit. Um, I may test to see if maybe there has been an update that enables it to work more reliably above 192, but 192 kilohertz is fine. It likes uh, 32 bits per sample according to the defaults here. I'm going to leave MQ MQA encoder core decoder on because I want the Rune core to do the MQA decoding and um, then send the decoded audio to the device for playback. It won't know, this device doesn't recognize MQA, so it won't know that it's an MQA stream, but at least most of the work in decoding MQA will have been done by a core. Um, and we'll save, we'll save to keep the rest of the defaults as is. All right, now if I go to my outputs, I should see this root output thing that I've picked here. With the volume by default is set to 100, which depending on what I have it connected to might be a little hot. I'm going to turn that down a little bit for now. Um, a couple more things that I like to do, um, depending on the DAC implementation, um, I like to have headroom man management turned on. I'll usually, the default here is minus three. I'll usually put a minus two. Um, it just some audio uh, is mastered so that the peak sample is, is at zero dB which means you can have some inter sample peaks that are above 0 dB, and not all DACs handle that very well. So I find turning this down just a little bit, while it, it doesn't provide bit perfect playback, it usually results in a little bit better sound. Um, another thing that I like to do is uh, enable volume leveling. By default, that's off, but I've switched it on at the album level. And target volume level for album level is 14 Lefts is a pretty good target. If you were doing track level, you'd want to use something a lot lower, like maybe uh, minus 22 or minus 23 lefts. But uh, album level, I think, works pretty well. It preserves the dynamic range of the entire album, but some albums are super hot. Some albums are super quiet. And when you're playing, uh, switching from an album to the next, it keeps you from having to dive for the remote control. And then if there's some album that doesn't have any uh, volume level information in, which Kobus tends not to, everything just gets a minus 5 dB uh, adjustment, which seems to work out pretty well when you're switching between Kobus and Tidal. Tidal does a very good job of storing the loudness information in the stream. Uh, Kobus currently does not. Um, and then uh, Rune in the background will analyze all of the tracks in your music library so that it can apply this adjustment uh, correctly. And uh, that's all the settings that we need. So with that done, um, this is uh, 
kind of a nice album here from a uh, title. So we can play this now. And I don't have speakers connected, so I can't hear anything, but we can see what's going on uh, looking at the signal path. So the source is a 24-bit, 352.8 kilohertz MQA file. Um, it's authenticated as a studio master by Rune Core. The core decoder is decoding it um, from the input level of 44124 to 84.224. Um, we're doing a bit depth conversion to 64-bit float so that we can apply the volume leveling and headroom adjustment at the highest possible resolution. Then, as you saw in the configuration for the sound card, it likes a 32-bit audio stream, so Rune is converting from 64-bit float to 32-bit and sending it out to the Hi-Fi Berry deck. Uh, it's kind of nice if I want to click on the product manual, I can get that. It'll open up a web browser with uh, information about how to configure the deck. I'm not going to do that right now, but if you have a supported deck, then it'll show up nicely like this. And that's pretty much all it takes to get uh, a simple Raspberry Pi with an audio hat working as a Rune output. And you can have multiple of these. You can have one in every room of your house, depending on how powerful your Rune server is and how many zones you're going to run at the same time and how much DSP is required for each one. Um, that's kind of the only limit is just the CPU resource limit in the uh, Rune core itself. I hope this has been helpful.